A brilliant young scientist, a husband, and a soon-to-be father, his flight lasted less than a minute before ending in disaster. And the crazy part? The aircraft was perfectly healthy. No engine problem, no weather issue. What killed him was one simple mistake at liftoff. And when you hear how it happened, you'll understand why this case has shaken up the entire gyroplane community. So, let's rewind to December 4th, 2022, Beverly Regional Airport in Massachusetts. The aircraft was a sleek Rotorsport Cavalon gyroplane. Registration, November 401, Golf Romeo. At the controls was Dr. Jeffrey Andrews, just 30 years old, a staff scientist at MIT Lincoln Laboratory with a PhD in aeronautics and astronautics from Purdue. On this day, he wasn't out on a big cross country. He was just planning a local flight after getting his gyroplane back from nearly three months in maintenance. The takeoff roll looked normal. Engine roaring. Avionics showing good numbers. No red flags. Andrews pulled off the runway and began climbing. About 40 feet off the ground, the gyroplane leveled briefly, then resumed climbing. But this time, the nose started swinging left in a big yaw. At roughly 150 feet, that yaw didn't go away. It actually worsened. The aircraft slipped sideways through the air, and then suddenly it snapped into a violent right roll. Witness video shows the gyroplane almost corkscrewing through a full 360 degrees before slamming back down onto the runway. The wreckage skidded over 200 feet. Andrews died instantly. His passenger survived but was left in critical condition. Now here's the key thing. Investigators tore apart the wreckage, checked the rotor, engine, and control systems. Everything worked. There was no hidden failure. The truth was much harsher. This crash came down to control inputs and a very specific aerodynamic trap that gyroplanes can fall into. Here's where it gets really interesting. Unlike airplanes, a gyroplane's body literally hangs under the rotor disc. That design makes yaw side-to-side -side movement something you absolutely cannot mishandle. When a gyroplane starts slipping sideways, the fuselage is now exposed to the airflow like a giant sail. Drag spikes, forces twist the frame, and the rotor disc responds in ways most people don't fully understand. In this accident, the rudder trim tab was found bent 30 degrees to the right, basically forcing the rudder left. That explains the hard yaw we saw on video. Once the gyroplane was flying sideways, the airflow actually shifted above the rotor disc instead of under it. That's when the roll axis effectively flipped on itself. And when that happens, the aircraft doesn't just drift, it violently snaps over. Now, here's the really frustrating part. Recovery is possible, but only if you act instantly. You've got to kick the rudder back, center the yaw, and push the nose down to get the fuselage aligned with the airflow again. But at 150 feet, forget it. There's simply no altitude buffer. By the time the roll started, Andrews had zero chance of getting it back. And that brings us to the deeper human side of the story, because as much as this was an aerodynamic trap, it wasn't just physics that brought the gyroplane down. Now, let's talk about the real driver of this crash, the human factors. Jeffrey Andrews had logged around 120 hours total, all in this exact make and model of gyroplane. At first glance, you'd think that's a strength. He was intimately familiar with his machine. But here's the truth. It's actually a double-edged sword. When all your hours are in one single aircraft, you don't build the adaptability that comes from flying a variety of platforms. He hadn't dealt with different cockpits, different handling quirks, or different training environments that force you to expand your stick and rudder skills. That narrow experience base leaves blind spots, especially in unusual or abnormal situations. And here's where the timing really mattered. This was Andrews' first flight in three months. Three months of no flying, no practice, no sharpening of muscle memory. Pilots call this rust, and it's very real. The reactions that used to be instinctive suddenly take conscious thought. The quick corrections you would have made without even realizing it now take an extra second. And that extra second is the difference between catching a yaw before it develops and letting it spiral into a side slip you can't recover from. 
It's one of those things that frustrates pilots. You can feel the rust in yourself, but it's easy to underestimate just how dangerous it really is. But it doesn't stop there. Toxicology revealed THC in his system. The NTSB couldn't prove that he was impaired, but let's be honest. Cannabis slows reaction time, impairs judgment, and alters perception. In daily life, you might not notice it. But in aviation, where seconds matter, it's unforgiving. Was Andrews actually high during the flight? We can't say. But even if the cannabis wasn't directly impairing him in the cockpit, it raises questions about decision-making before the flight. Should he have flown at all that day, after months off, and with THC still detectable in his blood? That judgment call, whether or not to go, can be just as critical as anything you do once you're airborne. So if you piece it all together, narrow experience, long break from flying, and potential cognitive effects from THC, you see the setup. He wasn't fully primed to handle the one thing the gyroplanes demand above all else, precise yaw control. And at just 150 feet, with no altitude to trade for time, that delay was fatal. This wasn't a lack of knowledge. It was readiness. It was reaction. And it came at the exact worst possible moment. Technically, the autopsy found heart disease, an enlarged heart and thickened muscle that raised his risk for sudden arrhythmia or incapacitation. And it's tempting to pin a tragedy on that, but investigators ruled it out for good reason. The video and data showed Andrews actively on the controls during the upset. There was no sudden collapse. His heart condition was real, but it wasn't the trigger here. And this is where the story shifts from technical to deeply human. Jeffrey Andrews was not just another private pilot logging hours on the weekend. He was a PhD aerospace scientist at MIT's Lincoln Laboratory working on advanced aeronautics. He'd done research at NASA Glenn and the Von Karman Institute for Fluid Mechanics. Just months before the crash, he was back at Lehigh University as a visiting lecturer, teaching students about hypersonics, the kind of cutting-edge work that pushes aviation forward. This was a guy with both brains and passion for flight, dedicating his career to the future of aerospace. But what makes the loss hit even harder is who he was outside the lab. He and his wife, Gentry, were expecting their first child that October. Think about that. A young couple at the start of their life together, planning for a baby, and in an instant, that entire future was stolen. Friends and family described him as charismatic, someone who loved music, and often sang in choirs wearing his trademark bow ties. He loved to cook, bake bread, scuba dive, take photographs, just live life fully. And that's what makes this crash bigger than aviation. It wasn't just the death of a pilot. It was the loss of a husband, a father-to-be, a mentor, and a brilliant mind whose contributions to aerospace were just beginning. When we talk about accidents, it's easy to get caught up in numbers, technical findings, and probable causes. But every single report represents a human life, and often an entire family's world torn apart. In this case, a child will grow up never knowing their father, and a field of research lost someone who might have led it into the next generation. That's the devastating ripple effect of one small mistake in aviation. So, what's the takeaway? The probable cause was straightforward. Improper yaw control during initial climb leading to excessive side slip and a loss of control. Simple words, devastating consequences. The first lesson is clear. Yaw discipline matters. In airplanes, yaw is easy to ignore. You get sloppy on the rudder and maybe you drift or skid a turn. In gyroplanes, though, yaw is life or death. Let it get away from you and the aerodynamics can flip you faster than you realize. That's what makes this case so striking. It shows just how unforgiving autogyros are when it comes to directional control. Second, skill decay is real. Pilots sometimes shrug off a few months away from the cockpit, but the rust is sneaky. It's not about forgetting how to fly. It's about losing the split-second instincts you need when things go sideways. Andrews was flying after a three-month gap, and that almost certainly contributed to how this unfolded. It's a hard lesson, but a critical one. If you've been out of the cockpit, get a refresher, do some dual time, knock off the rust before you fly solo. Third, Human factors are more dangerous than mechanical failures. The Cavalon was fine. The engine was strong. The systems were working. 
The weather was perfect. Nothing failed, except the pilot's readiness in that moment. That's the brutal truth about aviation. It's not usually the machine that gets you. It's the human behind the controls. And then there are the new discoveries. This crash highlighted just how poorly understood side slip is in gyroplanes, even by pilots. The manufacturer had to issue new safety guidance about yaw management after this accident. That tells you this wasn't just a personal mistake. It was a wake-up call for the whole gyroplane community. Add in the compounding risks, substance use, downtime, health factors, and you see how thin the safety margin can get. The final reflection is this. This wasn't just another crash in the record books. It was a vivid reminder that in aviation, the tiniest slip at the worst possible time can erase decades of potential in seconds. And in this case, it erased not just a pilot, but a husband, a father-to-be, a scientist, and a teacher whose best work was still ahead of him.